Before today, if you were interested in an enthusiast CPU for your new PC, but you were interested in both a high performance gaming experience and high performance when it comes to production workloads, you had a pretty important choice to make. Do you go with slightly faster frame rates or slightly faster render times? Well, today you don't have to make that choice any longer. Now, if you are looking for the ultimate CPU for your new PC, Zero Compromise is actually a thing, and it comes in the form of the new Ryzen 5900X and 5950X. So forget the last three years of Intel for gaming and Ryzen for production workloads, because gaming performance on these new Ryzen 5000 processors has truly been brought up to meet the top of the benchmarks. So let's take a look at what we're working with here. This review will go into both gaming and production workloads, as well as what you can expect when it comes to overclocking. Firstly, it's important to note that Ryzen 5000 is not two generations ahead of Ryzen 3000, as the naming would have you believe. It's just one, and it's actually built on the same seven nanometer manufacturing process. However, these chips are still very exciting, with the biggest change coming down to the internal core layout. Ryzen 5000 processors have significantly lower core to core latency than Ryzen 3000, with all cores in a given core complex die no longer being split into two separate CCXs with separate cache. The two CPUs that we'll be taking a look at today are right at the top of the food chain, the 16-core Ryzen 5950X and the 12-core 5900X. And make no mistake, these processors are expensive. All processors across the new stack have been bumped up by $50, and that means now instead of the 12-core 5900X being directly in line with Intel's 10900K, it actually costs slightly more. Even the 6-core this time around is $300 US but we'll leave that for another video. Another thing that has been cranked up a fair bit though in comparison to last gen is the boost clock, so let's take a look at that first. AMD have made it a clear point that with their Ryzen processors, there's actually no clear defined all core or single core boost clock, and that clock frequencies are dependent on a lot of factors. Regardless though, under the same conditions, I found the new 5950X to boost around 200 megahertz higher across all 16 cores compared to the 3950X, and don't worry, if you're interested in overclocking, we'll get to that towards the end. There are huge gains to expect there. But it's actually the 12-core 5900X that offers the higher all-core boost clock out of the two, and by quite a fair margin, turboing all 12 cores to just under 4.5 GHz in Blender. Impressively though, the new 5900X and 5950X run at the same socket power and TDP as the previous gen parts before it, and I actually found the 5950X to be pulling slightly less than all other three. This is quite an achievement for AMD, because you compare this to Intel who have been pumping more and more power into their chips since the 7700K, and the 10900K can easily pull up to 250 watts on its own. But now let's dive right into performance. Starting with production workloads and Cinebench R20, AMD's 7 nanometer refinement here definitely looks to be paying off. The 5950X is 12% faster here than the previous gen 3950X, and the 12 12-core 5900X is 17% faster than its predecessor. But it's the gains in single-threaded performance that are really interesting here, with gains of over 20%. Single-threaded speed is still incredibly important for 3D and content creation programs, and this is a huge jump for AMD. Most of you could probably guess, but the gaming results here are going to be interesting for sure. Hopping over to V-Ray, we see a 22% improvement for the 5950X compared to the 3950X, and a 20 4% improvement for the 12 core. In this program, performance for the new 12 core is actually on par with the previous 16 core, and that's seriously impressive for a benchmark that is entirely based on CPU rendering, and higher core counts do have a huge advantage. The improvements continue in Blender, where the 5900X and 5950X improve on their previous gen parts by 15% and 18% respectively. It's pretty clear at this point that these CPUs are the fastest mainstream desktop processors that you can buy for CPU-based rendering. 7-zip file compression gets a huge boost in performance as well. Again, we see the new 12-core matching the old 16-core, which makes it the better part based on value as well. But when we switch over to video exporting in Adobe Premiere Pro, I wouldn't consider these new processors to be too much faster than the old ones. There might be a few effects and functions within the program that can take advantage of the faster single-threaded performance, but some of you might actually prefer to pick up the discounted 39 
3900X or 3950X. At the very least, I probably wouldn't recommend going with the 5950X strictly for video editing purposes. Save the cash, go with the 5900X instead, and spend that saved money on more memory, storage, or preferably a faster GPU. And on that note of GPU performance, something worth considering is whether you actually even need a 12 or 16 core CPU for your creative workflow in the first place. If you have an NVIDIA 20 series or 30 series GPU, for example, GPU compute is incredibly powerful and efficient in some of the programs that we previously just looked at. That includes Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve, which both support H.265 encoding with the NVIDIA GPU and also Blender, which can take advantage of CUDA and Optics. So definitely keep that in mind if you are a creative professional. Overall, for production workloads, yeah, there's a nice boost of around 15 to 20% on average, depending on what programs you're testing. But the real interesting story here is when it comes to gaming. And that's because if you're building the fastest gaming machine that you can possibly build today, and you're trying to avoid bottlenecking your GPU at all costs, you're building with an AMD Ryzen CPU. The Ryzen 5900X and 5950X trade punches with Intel's top tier 10900K, a CPU that boosts up to 5.3 gigahertz on a single core, and as we saw, can pull up to 250 watts on its own. And sure, these are all fairly expensive CPUs, but I'd expect the 8 core 5800X and the 6 core 5600X to perform fairly closely as well. Now, before today, you could somewhat justify something like a 10900K for high end gaming focused machines, but now, not at all. There are still games where Intel will pull ahead by a couple of percent, just as AMD will pull ahead in just as many titles. The big catch though, Ryzen will pull far less power, has significantly more performance outside of gaming, and has more affordable motherboard options. Also, all of the testing here was done with an RTX 3080, so consider this pretty much worst case when we're looking at bottlenecking potential. Especially if you're looking at 1440p or even 4K resolution, the difference between these CPUs and a 10900K is going to be basically nothing. One standout result though in the testing was definitely Death Stranding, which saw relatively huge performance gaps over the 10900K. This game played fairly well on the 3900X and 3950X to begin with, and seems to really love core count, but for whatever reason we see very decent scaling up to the 5000 series parts. And again, you will have a few of those games where Intel does manage to pull ahead with the 10900K. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example, will play slightly better on the 10900K at 1080p, but with higher resolutions and lower frame rates, that difference pretty much diminishes. In terms of CPU thermals, both the 5900X and 5950X ran surprisingly cool when paired with a 280ml liquid cooler, with the 5950X being the slightly cooler running part of the two. I would also expect the performance here to be quite consistent across a variety of motherboards, because these two CPUs seem to like the socket power limit of 144 watts, no matter which board is being used. Overclocking headroom has also been increased by a decent amount on these new CPUs, and compared to the 3900X and 3950X, where you'd typically top out at 4.3 GHz, that frequency ceiling seems to be around 4.7 GHz this time around. With the 16-core 5950X, I managed 4.6 GHz at a load voltage of 1.23 volts, but 4.65 GHz required 1.27 volts, and at that point, a 280ml liquid cooler was just not enough for more than than a single run of Cinebench. Still though, this does result in a pretty hefty 16% increase in rendering performance. The 12 core 5900X was able to be pushed a little bit further. I achieved a pretty comfortable 4.7 gigahertz at 1.24 volts here with a bit of thermal headroom as well. The performance increase isn't as much here though, seeing as this chip already boosts to around 4.5 gigahertz on all cores. In closing, these are the fastest mainstream socket CPUs that you can currently buy on the market and the term that comes to mind is no compromise. These are in the purest sense, no compromise CPUs because you're still getting extremely good production workflow performance around 20% more than the previous gen and gaming performance has been brought up to the top of the stack. So really the only choice that you have to make now with a high end CPU is how many cores do you need for your system. Now, at least out of these two, I would be steering most of you towards the 12 core 5900X, unless you 
you actually make money with your PC for CPU based rendering, then the 5950X can totally be justified instead. For those of you exclusively looking at gaming processors, neither of these are a great choice based on value if I'm honest, and you really don't need 12 cores plus for gaming, so instead consider the 6 core 5600X and the 8 core 5800X instead. The only problem with those 6 core and 8 core parts is that they are not cheap this time around. Uh, AMD have not released non-X CPUs. The 6 core, for example, is a $300 US part, which is more expensive than Intel's 10600K, and some of you might be leaning towards that instead for a gaming focused build, but the chances are going to be slim. Definitely check pricing in your region. Another thing to mention is that the 3000 series parts are still a very valid choice uh, in my opinion. And I think that's one of the main reasons that AMD have stuck with this kind of expensive pricing in the meantime, while they managed to clear out most of their 3000 series stock. So if you want, you can check all of the Ryzen 5000 series parts linked down below in the description. A huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.